Hello and welcome back to Pinstripe Pulse. It is just after Thanksgiving and the hot stove is heating up. The Yankees have a lot to do for the 2024 offseason. We're going to walk you through what we think and want them to do. Hello and welcome back to Pinstripe Pulse. My name is Liam. I'm joined as always by Jake. Jake, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. The uh, the turkey may be out of the oven, but the oven is still very hot. So let's get right into it. Let's get right into it. And if you guys have been following us since last year, um, this is our episode, which we're going to go through building the Yankees roster uh, kind of from scratch. Obviously, we have our rules. We have our contracted players. Um, we have who the Yankees owe money to, and then we have a list of free agents, a list of potential trades um, that we're going to walk through and try and build what we think the Yankees 26 man roster is going to be on opening day or de facto the the core of the roster. Um, if they're, they might've picked up an injury early in the season, for example, um, the first order of business, Jake and I discussed, we are setting our cap to play with today at $287 million. Um, so that is the salary cap that we're going to be working with um, that falls in the upper threshold of the luxury tax um, based on the newest MLBPA and MLB agreement. So the Yankees would again be one of the top spenders in baseball. Um, And we're going to build up to that number. So we can't sign everybody. We're going to make sure we stay within that number. I think that's a a realistic place for the Yankees to, to land. What do you think of that number, Jake? Solid. Um, they've been around that number the last few seasons. I don't see that changing, especially with the abysmal season they had last year. Hal's going to want to spend. All right, so let's jump right into it. So again, we're building the 26-man roster. We're going to go through the different salaries that are associated that lead up to that cap. We're also going to break down position by position. Um, our first section here, we're going to start with the six Yankees that we are definitely keeping for 2024. Um, no trades, not even considering that. This is going to be the foundation of our team. Uh, once we get into the seventh pick and on, building up all the way to the 26th, we can trade guys away, we can trade guys in, we can sign free agents, um, or we can retain players again. We'll talk a little bit about a lot of the players that we're keeping. We're going to keep it brief. Uh, we're we're going to try and fly through this episode as best as we can. We'll probably have to break it up into a few for our recording purposes, but we got a, we got a whole big sheet here, and we have our, our baseball reference and our fan graphs helping us uh, along the way for some stats um, but we'll talk you through some of those some of those off-season conversation and see you know how realistic are these things um there's a lot of chatter there's a lot of agent driven stuff uh, so we're going to get into how real we think all of that is i'm going to start right away and i have a pretty easy pick for number 1 and i think you can go two obvious ways um i'm going to go as my number one, I still view him as the best player on the Yankees, arguably the best player in baseball, especially if Shohei Otani is not pitching this year. Uh, I'm going to go Aaron Judge. Um, Judge followed up his rate stats that were unreal from 2022 in which he played um, upwards of 155 games, uh, but he only played 100 this year. He almost eclipsed 40 home runs. He was still one of the top home run hitters in the American League, um, was the R- was the home run and RBI leader for the Yankees while just playing over sixty uh, percent of their games. I'd actually, I'm not even sure if he reached sixty percent, but he he played about hundred games. Um, he is the best player on this team. He has a big contract, and we're we're starting with a hefty number at forty million that puts us at forty nine million dollars spent if we include the Aaron Hicks deal, which we're still on the hooks for. Um, but what do you think of Judge overall, and Judge being that first pick? He's our anchor. He's our best position player that we've had this decade, this generation. Um, It's a clear cut, easy option. And I think our second guy is as well. So we'll get into that in a second. But I mean, you can't go wrong with Judge. That's our guy. Now, the one thing here, um, I have to make a decision for the sake of our sheet on what position he's playing. And I think it's pretty, it's pretty comfortable to put him in at right field. But is there any chance that we see Judge at center field in the absence of Dominguez and the absence of having any center fielder this year? I'm going to go with no, because I have a few different moves that can easily supplement center field. And one of those is more of a long-term move. Um, and then I see a like a really clear-cut depth, depth piece as well, who can just fill in. There's actually two stop gaps that are very like 
viable at this point. So I see that being no issue whatsoever. I don't think he's going to have to play much center field at all. I hope so. So we'll start with our first right fielder um, and take us into pick number two, Jake. That is an easy one. It's uh, another guy that's a big earner. That would be Garrett Cole, Mr. Cy Young himself. Finally received his first Cy Young, and rightfully so. He was the best pitcher in the entire league this year, um, plain and simple, especially in the AL. Uh, He's been dominant for a while now, but this is the first time that he truly put it together on the ERA side. The complete games, just as durable as one can be. Um, Strikeouts were still there. This is a perennial Hall of Famer, and it's clear as day that we still need him at the top of our rotation. He's our rock. Garrett Cole was the best pitcher in baseball this year. Um, And I listened to our episode from last year. You can go back and listen to it where uh, we spoke with our friend Jay Ray about where do we think Garrett Cole ranks in terms of baseball pitchers. Um, And I think... He is now definitively number one. Uh, you look at the competitors, you know, for a while, maybe Sandy Alcantara, Jason DeGrom, Jake, Jacob DeGrom, rather, Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander falling off, and all of them are showing signs of injury. Um, you know, you look at Snell this year, didn't even put up a lot of innings. Like, in terms of consistency, a guy who's going to throw 200 innings or at least upwards of 180 innings every year, sub-4 ERA, Garrett Cole has been doing that. And this year it was a sub-3 ERA in one of the toughest hitting divisions in Major League Baseball. I think he was the best pitcher this year. An easy, easy number two pick for me. Um, And another hefty contract, but I I think he's been been playing his way through it. He's made it very worth it for the Yankees, and I think his arm and his mechanics um, age very well. Obviously, I can eat my words in a few years, but Garrett Cole, I think, is an obvious number two pick. Yeah. Uh, And uh, talking to Yanks had a funny joke. Um, I think John Boy said a few weeks ago after Cole won the Cy Young. Um, all right, I have a game. Name all the players uh, who got first place Cy Young award votes this year in the American League. And then he picked Garrett Cole. And uh, <laughs> Garrett Cole is the only pick because he was the best player, the best pitcher. All right. I think that is going to be the easiest segment of this entire episode. Um, because I'm already in a tough spot personally, because I think the Yankees are at a point where I think no one else is unmovable uh, at the moment. Now, contracts might limit them into being movable, and I think that's where um, we'll get into what those contracts look like and the the realities of it. I'm going to go with not someone who I think is necessarily the third best player, um, but someone who I believe in for the value that the Yankees have them. Um, I'm going to pick Nestor Cortez. It is a, a bit of a stretch pick, um, potentially. But Nestor Cortez is on the books for $3.9 million next year. That's his projected arbitration for 2024. The value that Nestor Cortez has given the Yankees is way above that. Um, he had a bit of a tough year, statistically and injury-wise. Um, and, and that creates cause for concern because... Um, he had put up a, a bunch of innings that he was not used to throwing. Um, 2022, that was his all-star year, 158 innings. Um, by far his greatest workload. Um, but he was stellar throughout that whole season, and, and he was arguably a number two. And that's where we came into the season thinking that Nestor um, can put up a sub-3 ERA, right? He can be that number two. Um, this year, in just 63 innings, uh, he had just under a 5 ERA. Um this team needs value at pitching. You know, we we can't have Cole Rodon and Yamamoto. Um, that's a lot of money, and then just expect that they can cover all the five. I think Nestor Cortez needs to be in this rotation. He has shown the highest upside at the value that is available to the Yankees. Um, so that's why I'm I'm going Nestor Cortez, and I'm, you know, you're buying low on him. Uh, he he's he's been injured, but I think he has that upside to still be a solid two or three starter in MLB. He's shown it. I don't hate it. I mean, it's just a matter of if he can come back and do it again. Um, hopefully that shoulder is not nagging him because shoulder injuries can be quite a bit of an issue, lingering in that sense. Um, if he comes back fully healthy, then I think that he can easily be another number three, number four, just very reliable pitcher. Um. 
there's a few different ways that you can definitely go about that decision. He's also in a bit of the trade talks right now. I don't know how official those are, but I could see a team easily wanting a low cost, high value pitcher like him. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that plays out well. Yeah, to me, I pick him because I think that there are some other options that would be potentially give us higher value in trades just for the age that they're at um, and their projectability, whereas Nestor was never really sought of highly. But, you know, it kind of goes back and forth onto what teams want. You know, Nestor has done a full all-star season, right? He's been a number two for a solid playoff team, right? Like N- Nestor was reliable last year. We uh, relied on him down the stretch in the playoffs and everything, and he, and he gave a lot. So... Uh, it, it's really the comparison between some other players that we have, like Mike King, like Clark Schmidt, on you know what do teams want and where are they at in the rebuild for the player that we're looking for in a trade. Yeah, for sure. All right, take us into number four. Number four, um, we're going to a quite important position on the field, and that would be catcher. Um, I'm going to go with Austin Wells is going to stick around for a while. Um the Yankees have a plethora of talent at the catcher position currently on the 40 man roster. I want to say they have either five or six catchers right now. They really liked what they saw out of Austin Wells. So did I, um, this past season, he, in his shorter sample size, he went off to like a little bit of a slow start early on and then really found his stride in the last two weeks of the season. Um, the power is clearly there. The swing is built for New York city built for the stadium. He actually looked pretty good behind the plate, too. His framing wasn't an issue. His arm wasn't an issue. And those are the two things that have been kind of uh, scoffed at previously in a lot of the criticism against him early on. But um, he seems to be improving like very gradually at this point. So I think that he is going to, at, at minimum, be a platoon catcher for us and be that lefty bat that we need in the lineup. Yeah, and that last part, I think, is really important. Um Austin Wells being a plus hidden catcher when you can't really rely on Trevino or Hickey to do that. Um, of recent, uh, the Yankees can't afford to have any more holes in their lineup. I think there might be a position or two where you're really looking at like, you know, a catcher level type of production. Um, Wells can give you a hundred games. He can potentially DH if you play the cards, right. You know, Stanton is going to be hurt at, at some point if he's in the lineup. Um, so I think he's someone that can supplement there. The lefty swing plays. He he showed some really good contact tools uh, during his stint on the major league roster. I think you definitely need to have him. Uh, if he's not your number one catcher, he's at least platooning. Um, and you're 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 putting him in advantageous situations for him to hit and succeed, preserving his body for a while and continuing his development as a defensive catcher. Which I know the Yankee staff was um was pleasantly surprised with his defensive showing during his stint on the major league roster. So yeah, I, I love that pick. I, I might have gone the the same way. Um, but I'm gonna flip I'm gonna flip that back to a a different line of thinking. Um and and I mentioned there's no one who's unmovable uh and there's contracts that go into how practical it is to move somebody. Um and I think the best case scenario, um it, it was a weird year for this guy. Um, but the best scenario is for the Yankees to keep him and to slot him in at first base. Uh, I'm going to go with Anthony Rizzo. That was and- where my head was at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anthony Rizzo is on the books for $20 million next year. Um, part of that uh, two-year $40 million deal. Um, now, Rizzo had a wild uh, whirlwind of a season. Uh, Rizzo's April and May were as good as any player um, in baseball. He likely was on pace to be an all-star. He had one of the worst Junes and one of the worst months, frankly, in um, in all of baseball for players that got run out there every day. Um, that obviously came after his collision with Fernando Tatis uh, during the Memorial Day series with the Padres. Um, and that obviously derailed his whole season. He had a neck injury. Um, his concussion was not spotted right away. He showed signs of concussions that was later diagnosed in mid to late July. Um, and then the Yankees shut him down for a while. Rizzo has a, a big upside, um, and given that he's on a one-year deal, he was hurt last year, I don't see anybody biting on him in, in a trade, even if you're really down on Rizzo. Um, he's going to go. He's going to give great defense, uh, even if his bat is not what it used to be, um, and that you know that injury is part of his natural aging regression. Um, I think Rizzo has the potential to be still an all-star level player for you um, or just be a solid, you know, 
three, four, five hitter in your lineup. He is a lefty. He can find the porch. Um, with the shift changes, he's had a lot more contact than he did in 2022. Um, I think Rizzo provides awesome upside, and whatever you would get for moving him would not at all be worth um, the risk and the potential hold of not having him in the lineup. He's also currently working with Richard Skank, a.k.a. Teacher Man, a.k.a. Aaron Judge's personal hitting coach, um, which I think is pretty significant for him and just making sure that he's mechanically clean, especially coming back from the the concussion protocol. Um, I don't think it's a matter of whether or not his swing is going to be there. I just think it's a matter of whether or not the lingering effects of the concussion are an issue or not. Um, this is a guy who's best friends with Judge. It just makes all the sense in the world to keep him there. He's only there for one more year anyway. Um, there's very minimal downside on keeping this dude around, especially as you're starting first baseman, especially if he can get back to the form of where he was before the concussions, because he was a top three first baseman in the league um, the first half of the season. Yeah, for sure. And I said that he's on the books for $20 million. Um, I think the Yankees actually – had an interesting contract. I think he was paid twenty three million last year. He's only on the books for seventeen this year, so that's a pleasant surprise for his twenty twenty four. Um, his AAV was was twenty million a year, but they, um, they front loaded the contract, and I think that works out even better on on the Yankees end. Yeah. So, uh, take us into pick number six, the last definite returner for the Yankees. Like you said, all of these next picks are going to be tough, and this one is equally as tough for me. But it's. Based off of the money that he's getting, he's going to be on this team, and it was only his first year with the Yankees last season. That's going to be Carlos Rodon. Um, they're paying him big bucks to be at least a number two, and he did come back from having a chronic back injury that he was diagnosed with for the first time. Um, you have to imagine that at this point, he's understood what it takes to keep that under control. Uh, he knows how to maintain his body at this point. You have to go on under, go in with the assumption that he is going to do everything it takes to get back to form. Um, I don't see any world where he's getting moved with that big of a contract. So it's up to him ultimately, and also the Yankees staff, to work diligently to make sure that he's a serviceable two or three starter at this point. He's going nowhere. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, and we can look into Rodon's stats. And honestly, I, I think we talked to nauseam about them this year. They were not good. I, I think it's a clear and a hopeful outlier. Um, his K per nine was down. His walk rate was up. His homers per nine was way up. Um, every single stat you can think of. It was just a stinker for him this year. He could not stay on the field. He had barely a sub seven ERA. Um, but I'm with you. I, I think we were excited about Rodon signing. And, and that's, again, there's there's high upside there. Uh, and I think there's no one you're going to get, uh, if you get rid of him. Um, so like you would be selling way low. I think Rodon still has potential to be an ace. He's proven it. He's only 31. Um, he, he was not able to get really a, a decent run of form without injuries this year. Uh, and he's on the books for $27.8 million, uh, through 2028, you know, this is a different conversation in a year or two if Rodon does not return to form. Um, but I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt of a really weird, a really tough year um, in which he just gets back to full health. There's not pressure put on him um, to get back, which I know at times this year there was a lot of pressure put on Rodon to help save the Yankees. And he he could not and, and he would not, frankly. Yeah, and again, for the talent that Rodon um, has shown to be in in previous years. I mean, he was a consistent uh, high Cy Young finisher in the three previous years to being with the Yankees. Um, I think you have to you have to run it out, and you kind of have to hope um, at that money we're not getting anything valuable back. Uh, if you trade him, I think you hope, and I think there's still a solid chance of him being um, the the great number two that the Yankees need. Yeah, we got to hope that uh, Rodon is in a good place going into the season. He has a full regimen ready to, you know, roll out with Matt Blake and he's going to get cooking. Um, that leads us into our free agent picks, though. And with my first one, I'm going to go with the grandson of the wind, a.k.a. Jung Hoo Lee from the KBO. The Yankees are in desperate need of a center fielder, especially with Jason Dominguez being completely up in the air for this season. Uh, he's likely not going to be able to return until late summer, if that. 
Um, we can't assume that he's going to start the when he comes back with the big league team. Um, he's still very young. So I think it makes a lot of sense to go for a younger, controllable center fielder such as Jung Hoo Lee, who has um, had plenty of success in the KBO. He has an average of 340 throughout his career. Uh, his on-base percentage is around 400. His bat-to-ball skills are elite. He's a lefty bat. He has a very compact swing. And there are projections out there that say that he could be very similar to a player like, you know, Nick Markakis with a little bit more pop, maybe a little bit less batting average. And if you look at Nick Markakis' numbers throughout his career, that's a 2,500 hit guy. Um, that is a very, very solid borderline Hall of Fame player. With Jung Hoo Lee only being 25 years old and he's not going to command a big old salary, you're looking at maybe five years for 75 million. Um, 80 million tops, which is very economical for what you're getting. Um, that would make him a free agent after his age 30 season. That makes a ton of sense for me. And the Yankees would benefit from that greatly because it also leaves Judge in a situation where he doesn't have to play center field. That's a good pick, and it's a very interesting pick. Um, because Jung Hu Lee is pretty decent value. Now it's just a matter of how you think. Um, that projection goes over from the KBO. Now, um, the KBO is the Korean baseball organization, um, as opposed to the NPB, which is the the Japanese uh, top tier baseball league. Um, I think the KBO has sh- has shown more struggles with players coming over, um, and adjusting. But there's been, um, there's been some real bright spots. I mean, you compare to Nick, Nick Barkakis. Uh, I mean, if we're going to a Korean counterpart, the Shin Chu Chu um, has similar mechanics, even if they're not the exact same type of hitter. Um, and Chu was a very successful major league pro uh, for years and years. Uh, you're, Jung Hoo Lee is not a massive superstar, but you're looking at someone who is 25, who hits lefty, can play center field, uh, can also play the corners as well um, over there in Korea. And you're looking, like you mentioned, at about a $15 million dollar um AAV potentially even less than that. Um my one question for you with Jung Hoo Lee, I like the pick, is um and maybe we get to it later, but now uh, obviously you have to commit to this free agent for a five, six year contract, even more than that potentially. Um we have Jason Dominguez, we have Spencer Jones in the pipeline, we have Judge locked into right. Um we have Giancarlo Stanton who is still an outfielder. Um so How do you think that fits into the path of some of the top prospects coming up behind him? And how does he fit in long-term when everyone's healthy? Honestly, I don't think you can worry about that too much because you have to win now. You're in a window where Judge and Cole aren't getting any younger. Um, They are only going to age more and more. This is a tight window. You have a lot of uncertainty with how Dominguez is going to return when he becomes, when he's healthy again. Um, Of course, we would love for him to be the long-term center fielder and, I still have zero doubts in my mind that he will likely be that guy. Spencer Jones also has the upside of a Titan. Um, The dude is built for Yankee stadium, but at the same time, if they really want to trade away those guys or just think about winning in the short term and then dealing with the consequences later, I think that Jung Hu Lee is a, an economical move. That's not going to completely handicap you because you could always make a trade if you need to. Um, John Carlos Stanton needs to prove that he can still play in the field. I don't think he can anymore. Um, DH is really where he's going to dwell for the most part. Jung Hoo Lee provides the most current um, versatility that he can play all three outfield positions. And he also provides bat to ball skills that the Yankees greatly need. His strikeout rate was under 6% last year, the last two or three years. Um, That's elite. You're not going to get that from anyone else. And I've heard from quite a few people that his bat is going to translate pretty well. Like he's not going to strike out a ton. Um, So even if he is a high contact, but low power guy, you're looking at maybe a Stephen Kwan type of profile. And in my opinion, that type of player is very much needed for this team. You're looking at a better version of Andrew Benintendi, essentially. It's very interesting. I like Jung Hui, everything that I've seen. Um, The problem is there's only so much we can know about him, right? Like we haven't watched really any substantial KBO we're watching highlight packages we're we're getting fed some agent information but but you know the Yankees are in on them and I think you bring up very great points for where the Yankees are at now how he fits in um I think it is a really good match and at at the value that you're getting you know our sheet 
um, with the projections we're going off of online, has him locked in for about $13.3 million in 2023. Um, that's that's a really favorable deal. Obviously, it's a risk, you know, but if you're getting any consistent, any solid center fielder um, in Major League Baseball, you're you're paying, you know, upwards of 15 million, even for guys like Kevin Kiermaier, who who, who the bat, um, even though the defense is elite, the bat can be really low. So um, I like that supplemental pick. And where that puts us now is um, through seven players, we have spent one hundred and forty nine million dollars uh, <laughs> and we have. 138 million left. So Jung Hu Lee was that was that player that put us um above the top 50% of salary. And this is what happens. You have really good players, they're gonna get some really good money. Um and I think I kind of have to be boring for a second because I don't I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves on going out and getting guys because we have to fill out a roster. Um I'm looking at money, I'm concerned, I'm also now, now looking at the roster that we have and our options, I, I'm debating some of the preconceived notions I had about getting guys on the market. So I think I'm going to kick the can down the road a little bit, um, and I'm going to go a reliever, which is super sexy. Um, but <laughs> hot. Now, which reliever I go, I, I do think is interesting for the Yankees. There's a lot of guys on, on ARB deals. Um, we have Clay Holmes, who has been a closer, but he's his projected ARB is about $6 million. Um, we have Jonathan Lewisica. Uh, we have Michael King and Clark Schmidt. Who, where do you count them as? I think that's that's really interesting. Also, Scott Efros coming back from injury. Um, I'm gonna go with Clay Holmes. Now, six million dollars is a hefty price tag for a reliever. Um, it is his last year of arbitration, so he's getting um his he's getting his work of of All Star reliever money based on the production that he's had, even though he has shown some inconsistency. I think his 2023 year uh, was really solid. We, we were very concerned about him um, coming into 23 because he had an amazing first half in 22 um, and a not so amazing second half in 22. Uh, Holmes, I think, is one of the best closers in baseball, and he's shown that he doesn't have to be locked into a closer. Um, down the stretch, he was put into some really – high leverage situations in which he excelled at all different innings within games. Obviously the Yankees were not pushing for the playoffs, so it does add um, a bit of a different pressure. Um, but if you look at reliever numbers, um, you know, guys don't put up consistently the numbers that he does. Um, and he put up a sub three ERA as a high leverage reliever in 2023, pretty consistent throughout the year. He can pick up anywhere from 20 to 30 saves, depending on how the Yankees use him. Um, I value him highly. And I am willing to lock in that six mil. I think it's a fine move. Um, I've always liked clay. It's just a matter of, uh, he goes through some bursts of kind of losing his release point. That's when he gets the run instead of the sink on his mm-hmm. two seamer. Yeah. Um, that's expected with a lot of two seam pitchers. It's not everyone's the a, like pinnacle of consistency all year round. He's been durable. He's barely dealt with injuries for the most part. Um, yeah, I have no issues keeping him around, especially being yes, like an eight or a nine in our um, the back end of our bullpen. Um, also, it beats tra- signing a guy like Josh Hader, who's going to be around twenty million a year for five years. So, way I'm all for it. Yeah, way too much money. And also, we have a few different arms that we can talk about. Um, they did trade or sign. Gary De Los Santos recently from the Pittsburgh Pirates. He profiles very similar to Clay Holmes and he has a minor league deal. So there are going to be arms that are coming up. So I have no issues having a veteran of Clay Holmes in there and locking everything down. Um, That being said, I know we already spent a lot of money and I think we have to make a big splash on the trade market because that's kind of what every Yankees fan is waiting for at this point. Uh, we are going to be taking in what about thirty-two million dollars of uh, arbitration money this year by trading for Juan Soto, because I do not see the Padres being able to keep him. In that trade, I think this is going to be a little fun because we can really talk through this. But the Padres desperately need starting pitchers because they're very depleted at this point. We have starting pitchers in the system and also MLB ready guys such as Clark Schmidt and Mike King. I would prefer to hold on to Mike King as long as we can because I do see him being a starter for us. He could be a formidable number three or four with his stuff. Um, 
That being said, I would give them Clark Schmidt in a heartbeat because he did prove to at least be a reliable arm that can eat you innings. So I give them Clark Schmidt. I give them Chase Hampton, who is one of our top-rated pitching prospects. By the way, the uh, pitching prospects out of the Yankees are the top-rated, in I think, a top-three pitching farm in the nation um, yep. in terms of what you have in the farm system, which is really impressive because that's something that I think we were always knocked for is our pitching depth from the minor league level. So give away Chase Hampton. You give away maybe a Luis Hill heel um, in there as well. And then also an Everson Pereira. We have a couple other positional prospects. I mean, what are you thinking about that package so far? So I like the trade and it was actually where I was going next. And I was kind of scared to take it before clay because I think there's a lot of different options. The Padres are going to be looking for now. The Padres leverage is something that I find to be very interesting in my head. The Padres from the Yankees, the Padres have a lot of leverage because Juan Soto is a hall of fame talent Um, on a, a different token. Juan Soto is going to be looking for a place where he can commit long-term. The Padres need to get rid of him, and they cannot afford him. He's getting paid $33 million in ARB this year. Uh, free agency is going to be well above that number. You're looking at Juan Soto getting somewhere from 40 to $50 million a year um, as a 26-year-old free agent. Uh, Juan Soto is on a Hall of Fame path already. You know, if If he... If he never played a game of baseball, there would be people that might give him votes for the Hall of Fame, given at how elite of a level he's been as a teenager and early 20s um, run producer and hitter overall. But everyone knows the Padres have to get rid of him, um, and it's only a one-year deal. So I think you're looking at Clark Schmidt going back in return. Um, I'm a bit pessimistic on some of the Yankees' pro talent. Um, If I'm the Padres... Uh, I'm not looking for an infielder. They have a plethora uh, of infielders. Uh, I think you're looking at Everson Pereira, um, potentially end Esteban Florial. Um, if I'm the Padres, I'm asking for Spencer Jones. And uh, if the Yankees push that, I don't know that they can or they would, nor what that leverage looks like. Um, it's just a one-year trade. So I do think that would be a bit out of the realm of possibility. I mean, Spencer Jones is a top three Yankees pro- prospect. Uh, he is, uh, by by most accounts, in the top 150 or so prospects in Major League Baseball. Um, they might be looking for pitcher back. Is that Will Warren? Is that Drew Thorpe? Um, I'm comfortable. Let's, let's do this consensus. Uh, I think Clark Schmidt is the number one in the trade. To me, you're looking at two more players. I'm going top-end pitcher in the farm, so either a Drew Thorpe or a Chase Hampton. Um, I would try to go Chase Hampton first because Drew Thorpe was the pitcher of the year in the minors last year. Um, And then Everson Pereira. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, And the the Nationals got a lot more back for for Soto when they traded him to the Padres. Um, But Soto had two and a half years left on his deal. Now we're looking at one year left on his deal. Um, You're not going to, you're not going to get a CJ Abrams uh, if you're from, from the Padres point of view. Uh, So I, I think, I think that that's a pretty decent haul. Um, So that's what we'll walk into. So we'll go Soto straight up. We'll take on the 33 million. Um, That's the biggest thing for the Padres. We give away Clark Schmidt. We give away, um, who is it? Pereira and yeah. Hampton. Yes. Okay. Interesting. 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 <laughs> Powerhouse. Yep. All right. And where does that get us with money? All right. So that gets us. We're paying a hundred and eighty-seven million dollars. We have a hundred million left. Uh, for fifteen players or 16 players mm. um i i think that fits though now do you think the yankees try to sign him long term yes i mean they're going so here's the thing the way that i see it is that you have a year window where you can at least negotiate with him and do everything in your power to persuade him to sign he may not do it but show him entice him how fun it will be to play in new york city for the rest of his career how much 
glitz and glam he can get, how much uh, prestige will come with that title of being a Yankee for life. Um, I don't, the way that I see it is that you can play keep away and keep him away from another AL East team or another rival that may try to trade for him this season or may try to get him in free agency. Like I would feel sick to my stomach if I saw him in an Astros uniform or in a Red Sox uniform, even if that is only for a year. So if I'm the Yankees, I'm strictly being as selfish as I can with this one and trying to lock him down as much as I can and just keep him away from your rivals. Yeah, um, totally. Do you think the Yankees would try to entice them to take some of the money um, and add in a prospect or are the Padres kind of beyond that point? Like, I, th- I think the Padres might be willing to take the hit of a potential prospect they can get if someone eats all of their money. But that, that's how I feel. What do you think? I could definitely see that. And I could also see someone like a Jake Cronenworth being added on to that contract as well, just so that way you eat some of it um, in that trade. And like, it just justifies moving that much money, you know? Um, yeah. I think that that's an easy way to make that work for both sides. And also it allows the Yankees to explore a certain trade for a certain, to move a certain middle infielder that's making about what, 11 million this year. Ooh, that is very interesting. Yes. Um, but you can, uh, We'll we'll get to him later, but that, I know. that is some money that is due on the books. Okay, uh, with with that trade, um, I I know I'm being boring again, but I think this is a an essential piece that we have to to look at now. We already have three starters returning to the Yankees, um, and I'm going to lock in the best value starter because now we're we're looking at money. We just got rid of Clark Schmidt. Um, I think Michael King is the easy next pick, uh, and. Mike King showed down the stretch last year, and that was the one silver lining of the Yankees being completely out of it, um, that he can prove to be an MLB starter. He he went up to for three innings to four innings to five innings, even touched six at times last year. Um, he was a consistent starter in the minors before he found that lane with the 2022 Yankees of being that super war two inning reliever, two plus inning reliever stopper. Um, King has the arsenal that he. Um, that he can be a major league starting pitcher. Um, there's going to be a bit of a curve that he's he's going to work up to some innings, um, and you know he's not going to throw 180 innings next year. That I think that's out of the realm of possibility for him. Um, but he's on the books. His, his projected arbitration is 2.6. Now I think that's a bit low um, because I think his agent is going to ask for a starting more like a starting pitching number. Um, but the Yankees are within the right to say that he only did you know, injured starting pitching or high level relief pitching innings last year uh, because he was throwing less frequently. Um, so I think it's it's going to be maybe a three or $4 million deal, but for a reliever with the upside that King can give you just someone who can give you 130 innings at a four, four and a half ERA. Um, potentially I'm hoping he's the fifth in this rotation right now. We have Cole Nestor, Rodon uh, and King. Um, and I have a, a fifth up my sleeve if, if Jake doesn't snake him later. Nice. Um, but I, I, <laughs> I know who you want. <laughs> I need I need a lock. Um, I need to lock King in for this money in this rotation uh, to validate a later move. So I'm, I'm going to lock in Michael King. No, I fully agree. Um, King, in my eyes, is still Corey Kluber 2.0 if you're looking at him as a pitcher, um, as a starter. Uh he has the pitch arsenal to be a number three even. So if you have him as your five in a very formidable lineup, that is a fantastic number five to have. Um, And he's young and he's controllable. He loves it in New York City. I'm all for it. The only reason I didn't pick him is honestly because I thought there might be a possibility of him having to be moved in that Soto deal. But if he is retained, that's a win-win for the Yankees. All right. Um, Jake, what is your... Next pick now. Now, actually, I'm going to give a bit of a, a bit of an overview of the guys who we're still locked in for that we owe for next year and yeah. who have not been picked. Uh, so remaining who have no options on free agent deals, non arbitration deals, uh, we have DJ LeMayhew, Glaber Torres, Jonathan Lewiska, Kyle Higashioka, um, and John Carlos Stanton. So. Yeah, for what I'm deciding right now, I'm going to go with one of those veterans, and it is going to be DJ LeMayhew. 
because he did show significant upside in the second half of his season after dealing with injuries the last two and a half years. Um, he really turned things around after the All-Star break, and he looked like DJ LeMahieu of the past that we were used to seeing. It looked like he wasn't having issues pushing off that back leg anymore. Weight shift wasn't a problem. His glove is always going to be solid enough. Um, third base, he's proven that he can play it. Second base, he's still close to a gold glove caliber. His arm strength isn't obviously that great, but he's versatile enough that he can play third, first, second with no issues, and then also DH from time to time. If you get 130 to 140 games out of him at around like a 770 OPS, like that's a very successful season out of DJ. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I, I don't think we're going to get good value if we trade him. And I think DJ has potential to be like a utility infielder, hit 270, um, solid defense. He, he's getting older, um, but he, he seemed to have a, a resurgence in the, the, I won't even say power, but the support of, of his swing. Um, just having a hard singles, doubles kind of hitter. Um, not looking for 20, 25 homer DJ. We just need 12 to 15 bombs. Uh, 270, maybe a 350 on base guy um, to potentially flash at the top of the lineup or just be a solid middle of the lineup hitter to keep things going. And we've lost, we lost that from DJ for a while, but the second half of last year showed some really awesome signs. Uh, he's locked in for 15 million. Um, so you're not going to get that off the books. He's he's going to age poorly. Um, and then we'll, we'll see what his position looks like as he gets older, uh, depending on Anthony Rizzo. Um, and I think my one question for DJ is where do you think he plays right now? We have an empty third base, second base, and a shortstop slot. Um, and we have Rizzo at first. So what do you think is his primary position, if that's uh, even a valid question to ask for him? I'm going likely third base right now. Um, I think that's the easy one. There are a few different free agent signings that we can make to supplement at third or second. Um, and also, with, I think there are trades that are inevitable at this point in the infield. Um, it just has to happen, even though we're going to get some value. We're going to lose some value. We're going to gain some value in certain places. I'll put it that way. Um, I think you're looking more at DJ as a third baseman than a second baseman at this point, but ultimately you too. Yep, for sure. And he'll, he'll rotate around. We have a few more guys on the books. Um, aside from those free agents that I just mentioned, I'll get into my next pick. Uh, next, we also have some guys who uh, we have, uh, committed to tendering contracts to that uh, in their arbitration deals, that being Gleyber Torres, uh, Kyle Gashioka, Jose Trevino, um, and uh, Clark Schmidt we have traded away, so he is off the books there. Uh, so we have two catchers, a second baseman, a big second baseman for our team who we'll talk about. Um, I'm going to go for my big transaction. I think we're going to have to get a little bit nifty once we do this. Um, but I'm I'm looking at uh, the construction right now. Our positions that are open, we're looking at second base, shortstop, and DH. I know there's some big money with that. Our bench pieces um, and our relievers are are pretty open on the board right now. But in, in terms of money, I think I'm confident that we can make this deal uh, and we can still stay under that 287. Now, there is a lot of clamoring for this Japanese free agent, um, a guy who shined. Uh, really well in WBC and for the last few years um, in the NPB as well. He's been the, by far the best pitcher in Japanese baseball um, and a guy who very interestingly, as opposed to previous Japanese pitchers, um, seems to have mechanical as well as personality projectability to an American culture and, and Major League Baseball. Um, I'm going to go with Yashinobu Yamamoto. Now, the big thing with him is the years and the AAV. What's that going to end up looking like? Uh, Yamamoto has been the best pitcher in the NPB, like I said, for the Oryx Buffaloes. Um, and I think a lot of teams are hellish on him because he has um, he has a very MLB-type arsenal and mechanics um, that previous Japanese pitchers uh, tend to stick within a, a, a – more defined, big, long windup Japanese kind of culture of pitching. And Yamamoto has a, seems like a very innovative mix of, of the best of the Japanese and American pitching minds that, that have been in his ear. And, that, and that's an awesome impact of this globalization of baseball. My concern with Yamamoto, how much is it going to end up being? Uh, every rumor we hear, Dodgers, Cubs, Mets, 
Yankees, Cardinals, Giants, um, and even I, I miss on a few teams there. I'm looking at for a 25 year old from Japan who is as proven as a zero service time player can be. Um, Fangraphs has him projected at eight years, two sixteen. Um, actually, that's not even Fangraphs. That is MLB and just baseball and crowdsource projections. I think it might need nine. What do you think his contract might look like? I'd say anywhere from seven to nine years uh, with an opt out at some mm-hmm. point, probably in the first three or four years, because he if he does get an opt out at year four, let's say he'll be 29 entering the free agency market again. Um, this is a young 25 year old that we're talking about. He's not like he's just turning 25 now. Um, he's at the beginning of his physical prime. Not even he's just entering it. He's proven he's durable as hell. He's there. I've heard people have concerns about him being a smaller pitcher because he's around 5'10, I That's want to say. But one, yeah. at the same time, if you look at him and if you look at him on the mound, he gets great extension and he has the levers of someone who's a little bit taller. Like he does not look that short to me um, when he's pitching because he's very athletic and he moves very well. He's an elite mover, and I think that's what makes him so good. Um, He can get that fastball up to the high 90s, but he sits 94 to 96. This is a really good pitcher. Um, The market for him is going to be vast, faster than anyone else out there. Like That says something, too, because Blake Snell's out there, and he just won a Cy Young, but he's also 30, 31 years old. Um, With Yamamoto at his age and his ability to perform on the big stage, you're looking at a contract that's definitely worthy of eight years to 16 mil or something along those lines. Yeah. And the, the word that you use was really good. His movement, his body control is, I find to be very impressive from the clips I've seen of him. Um, and it aligns with his accolades. I mean, he was two time MVP as a pitcher of the NPB, a three time triple crown winner, three time, uh, their equivalent, the, Sa- the Sawamura award, the Cy, the Cy Young in Japan. Um, and that's kind of what I mentioned about like the Japanese and American style kind of combining to someone who even for their small frame has elite movement and speed. Um, you know, the, the only concern is how does that translate with the major league baseballs, which are different than NPB. Um, but he showed and ha- had some sense in the WBC where he was really solid. Uh, so I don't have that many concerns there. The only thing um the only thing I have concerns about is maybe he has more innings or more high pressure innings in major league baseball. Um, but he comes, as you said, a young 25 with not as many innings, not as much tax on his arm as a Masahiro Tanaka did, for example. Um, Tanaka was the best pitcher in Japan from the time he was 16 years old, uh, was throwing over 200, 250 innings every year leading up to, uh, when he signed with the Yankees. I think Yamamoto has, he's been a workhorse, um, but, He's a bit more efficient with his body. Hopefully, we don't know the results of any physicals. He does not have any tears in his UCL. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm confident with the Yamamoto. I think he would be a fantastic Yankee. And I think it really, um, the idea of signing with the Yankees really entices him, hopefully. And he's also considered to be better than Kodai Senga in mm-hmm. the NPV, which says something because Kodai Senga was a top three pitcher in the NL last season. Yeah. Um, so that is definitely worth mentioning. For sure. All right. Um, Jake, I think let's go one more pick for you and then we'll we'll take a break and we'll we'll come back with uh with the rest of our roster later. But to give a bit of an update, we have spent two hundred and thirty-two million dollars now, including the signings of Jung Hu Lee, the trade for Juan Soto, the acquisition of Yashinobu Yamamoto. We've gotten two uh two lefty hitting outfielders, two Asian superstars, and we have about fifty-five million dollars left to spend for about 15 roster spots. So where, where are you going next? Mm. I feel like I need to do a boring move just to counteract all the exciting ones that I've made so far and then save some of the bullets for later on because there are still, like there's plenty of roster construction that we need to get into. Yep. Um, I'm going to trade away Kyle Higashioka for cash considerations. Wow. I think it's time to uh, bite the bullet and accept the fact that he's not going to be in the Yankee this upcoming season. There are so many catchers on the roster right now and you need money in order to make some flexibility work um i could easily see them also because he is serviceable and can potentially start for any other team getting a starting role and getting traded for a decent prospect because the yankees have a knack for 
trading away guys that are close to the end of their arbitration and getting back decent return prospect capital wise. So I see that happening. I think that's a mutual great fit uh, for both sides. Um, and yeah, you mentioned it's a boring move, but it's something that we need, right? Where we're locked into giving him a few million dollars. Um, and, and I think that gives the option of either Trevino or Rortvet to supplement with Austin Wells, who uh, we've already locked into. I think Higgy can be a solid starter or backup on a variety of teams throughout baseball. And yeah, I think his time is up. He's been, he's been with the Yankees for a very long time, but supplementing Higgy with Wells is not the balance that you need. I think you need a, a premier defensive catcher though. Higgy is awesome. He is well liked in the clubhouse. Um, It's kind of an unfortunate move, but I, I think it's a, it's a natural part of making sure that the Yankees are progressing into this next era of Yankees baseball, despite how, how loved he was. Um, again, no Higgy can run into some homers. Um, he's, he's a cult hero on, on Yankees Twitter, but you're talking about a guy who's generally a sub two, uh, sub 200 batting average. Um, and that's just not something that we want really from a catcher who's going to catch anywhere between 80 and, and a hundred games, unless they're giving elite defensive production, uh, which he didn't do despite his great uh, pitching management. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate everything that Higgy has done for this team, but it's definitely time to uh, part ways and allow the younger guys to get some run. For sure. All right, uh, let's take a pause there. But before we take our pause, um, stuff for us to think about to simmer on. I'm going to go through what the roster looks like right now. Um, again, like we mentioned, we have 55 million left. We have Higgy. Um, Higgy is off the books, so we don't owe him money anymore. We only have. Uh, one, two, three. We only have three players left that, that we owe contracts to, um, that we haven't, uh, that we haven't already selected. So that puts us in a good spot. That fifty-five. However, one of those is a very big contract, or even two of those potentially, depending on how you look at it. Um, but here's what the what the Yankees roster looks like right right now. We are our starting catchers, Austin Wells. Our starting first baseman is Anthony Rizzo. Second base and shortstop are currently vacant. We have DJ slotted in for third base. The, that's subject to move. Juan Soto in left field currently. Jung Hu Lee, uh, our new free agent signing from the KBO in center field. Aaron Judge playing right field at vacant DH and a vacant offensive bench. Our starting pitching rotation, Garrett Cole, Nestor Cortez, Carlos Rodon, Michael King, and Yashinobu Yamamoto. Um, so our five starting pitchers are rounded out, and then we have our one relief pitcher slash closer, Clay Holmes. So we have a bullpen to get to. We have a middle infield, a DH, and our bench to round out. And I think that's a good place to pause for now. What do you think? For sure. I think we there's some obvious moves that are going to be thrown in there. Um, there are also quite a few difficult decisions that we need to make, and it'll make for a very good conversation moving forward. I hope so. So we'll break there and uh keep listening and we'll have the part two uh either in this episode or in in a next episode i'll i'll edit that so we're certain by <laughs> by, <laughs> by the end of this nice. um, thank you guys for listening and we'll tune in for the rest soon peace